Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, Gio. Good. We've got about 38, I say about, we've got 39 participants now. Um, 41, why they're pouring in, pouring in. So we might wait just a moment or two to get started so we know that everyone's here. For those of you who are just arriving, if you could remember to put on mute as you arrive, that'd be great. And for those of you who are arriving, if you can just try to think up two things that you took away from yesterday's session, just two, two things that you went away with really remembering. If you weren't able to attend yesterday's session, then try to think up two things, perhaps from the day before or any of the other days. Two things from yesterday's session and note them down because you're going to need them in a minute. This is not a, a rhetorical question. Okay, so we've just tipped over 50 participants which is a little lighter than we're used to, but it's, it's still good. So I think we might get started. So welcome everybody to our fourth day of the Global CCCM Cluster Annual Meeting. We're really pleased to have you here. Um, yesterday we had a fantastic session on participation, accountability and inclusion um, from Asherin, from Mario and from Giovanna. And I would like to invite Giovanna to come and say hi, just so I can ask you a couple of questions about yesterday see how it went. So Gio, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hooray, how are you doing? Good, good, thanks Charlie. Good, so I'm gonna ask you the same thing that I asked all the participants, which is, can you tell me two things for you as the facilitator, mm. two things that came out of yesterday that really stuck with you, that were really important for you? Um, yeah, so I think for me it was important uh, um, I mean, to re realize uh, that it's um, very important to keep, you know, to keep challenging ourselves in the way we, you know, conceptualize or uh, practice uh, participation and accountability in our um, CCM activities. Uh, so it was a bit the purpose of uh, the session, but, uh, you know, I was glad to see, uh, and it was important to me to see that there was, uh, you know, um, yeah, different opinion or like constructive criticism, so it was very good. And then also uh, these are the points that uh, so what was um, mentioned in the session so that uh, you know as CCM practitioners we do have the tools we do have the guidance but it's always uh, important to remember that uh, if we want to really understand what uh, you know affected community needs what are their priority uh, you know we need to um, try to understand you know with our brain but then also with our heart so yeah this is where I yeah, and I think that was a massive point, right? There was a lot of talk about, and I think there's always a lot of talk about creating new tools or systems or guidelines. But I think a couple of points came out yesterday that are really key that a lot of these tools already exist. And a lot of the information's out there. It's about applying it and making sure it gets to the right people. So that's really important. Thanks, Joe, And thanks for a fantastic session yesterday. <laughs> What I'd like to do now is I'd like to ask all of you, all 80 of you, because we now suddenly have 80 people in the room to do the same. And I'm gonna explain how we're gonna do it. So we're gonna do it in three steps. So the first thing is in a moment, I'm gonna ask Juan to put you into around, I think probably 27 different groups. So there'll be about three of you in each group. And I want you to, before you get into that group, I want you to think of two things that you took from yesterday then we're gonna throw you into the group for five minutes, no more, maximum five minutes. And I want you to listen to your colleagues and share your own reflections of the two things that you took away from yesterday. So by the time you finish with that group, you should have six things, your two and your two new friends too. Um, and then we're gonna pull you back and then we're gonna do it again in another meeting room. So by the end of this little exercise, you will have met four new people perhaps, and you'll hopefully be thinking about 10 things that came out of the session yesterday. So I hope that's clear. Just think of two things that you took away from yesterday. And in a moment, we're gonna put you into a meeting room and we want you to share your two things and hear the two things from the other people in the meeting room. But remember, you'll have to go really quickly 
because we're only going to have five minutes. Juan, wave at me if we're ready. We're ready. Okay, let's throw everybody into meeting rooms. Go. You will have to accept with a little thing that pops up on your screen and ask you to join the meeting room. So you have to accept that. If you don't accept and don't go, we know it's because you're just here checking your emails and that's very bad, it's frowned upon. Um, Charlie, if I see people alone, should I? You could move them, yeah, maybe. But hopefully a lot of people who are still in the room because I think we've still got quite a few people in the room with us should yeah. be heading to those meeting rooms. We may need to just give people a couple of minutes to get into those rooms. Okay, see so some people. I can still, we've, we've only got about 20 people still here with us. There may be people who are arriving just now who weren't into the meetings. So you might wanna, you might wanna just assign some people who are yeah, in the Yeah, I'm doing that because I see that some people are a bit alone. Okay. So folk, if you've just arrived these last two, two seconds, what we're doing is we're just doing a little recap exercise. So Juan is gonna to try to send you to a room um, and we'd like you to share a couple of things that were important for you from yesterday's session with the people in that room. There should be one or two people in that room. It's just a chance to meet some new people and share what you took away from yesterday's session. We'll give you about five minutes and then we're gonna call you back together. So. Um, if you haven't already, think up a couple of things that were important from yesterday and get ready to share. To go to the meeting room, you will need to just accept the little invitation that pops up on your screen. So when one, one moves you, there'll be something on your screen saying, go to room two or go to room 12 or 24 or something. I can see people are just arriving. I can see Joe who's just arrived and Mathilde who's just arrived and Tasha who's just arrived. So for you folks who are just arriving now, everyone else is in meeting rooms. Uh, they're just sharing two things that they took away from yesterday's session. So hopefully we'll assign you to a meeting room in just a second and you'll have a chance to share two things that you took away from yesterday. It's a sort of more active recap than just listening to me. So Ndume and Catherine, uh, I think you've just arrived. Maybe Mathilde didn't hear either. Um, and Adam and Frederick all arriving now, just to say that we are, we've just started the session. And so most people are in breakout rooms at the moment, they're just sharing a couple of things they remember from yesterday. Um, we're gonna pull them back from their meeting rooms in a couple of minutes. So it's probably an idea just for you to take a moment and reflect on what you took away from the session yesterday, what was important and perhaps think about what it might mean for you in terms of your work, how you might change your work based on what you did yesterday or what we covered. And then when I think at five to the hour, we'll close those meeting rooms. So I don't know if you have a one minute, uh, I think you give them one minute or 30 seconds or something when you hit close. So. Do you want me to hit close at 5-2 or? Uh, yeah, 5-2 would be fine. Seems There's all these folk who are arriving just now. <laughs> this teaches us something. We can't do breakout rooms until we're at least 15 minutes into the session, I don't think. <laughs> So welcome to everybody who's just arrived in the room. The reason we don't have very many people is because we have about, I think, probably 100 people in meeting rooms now that we've just sent them to meeting rooms. And what they're doing is they're reflecting on what we did yesterday. So 
they're talking about a couple of things that they took away from yesterday that were really important for them. So as that activity is nearly finished, if you've just joined us, just take a minute to think about two things that we covered yesterday that were really important to you. Um, and then we will be carrying on with the main session. I like the power though, huh? <laughs> We're back. Okay, Juan, do you want to hit, hit the close the meeting room session? Yeah, so they've got a 60 second warning just now. Yeah, it's going to be 60 seconds, then everyone will flood back in. Yeah, but now we got the taste of the cafe, so we just <laughs> wanted to keep chatting. That's good, that's the aim. <laughs> So Hong, thanks for your very honest message in the chat that you weren't able to attend the meeting yesterday. Uh, so no problem. I'm sure you've got lots of your own experiences of participation that you could share, um, but there'll be plenty more coming out of today's session. So that should be good. We are only 43 now because the people got scared of the breakout room. So because <laughs> no, I think they're still in the breakout room, Gio. <laughs> you know. I think that in, in a few seconds, they'll automatically all come flooding oh, okay. back here. Uh, I was wondering too, I said, where's everybody? Yeah, watch the numbers go up now. So what are we up because to? Now? Okay, I think, do we have everybody back? Something's happening with my screen, so it's not displaying how many people we have. So I'm going to assume that we pretty much uh, do. Yeah, we are back. We're now right. eight, three. Thanks, yeah. And thanks for thanks for doing the, the meetings. Okay, everybody. So I hope that was an interesting experience. I hope you got a chance to meet somebody new. Um, it would be very unlucky, I think, if you landed in a in a room with people you already knew really well, but then actually might maybe quite lucky because you get a chance to catch up with them, which is good. Um, and one of the things that we did earlier today was something a bit like that in terms of catch up. So we had one of our networking sessions. These are indicated by the stars on the slide that I'm sharing with you now. So we just had an hour this morning where we had a bunch of people join us and we just joined rooms and had a chat, really. Got a chance to catch up with old friends and meet new ones and talk about what we were doing and what we were thinking and how we were feeling and all those sorts of important things that are particularly good in, in COVID times, I think. If you want to join a networking session where we have no particular agenda, but it's just an opportunity to meet other people working in CCCM, um, then you can attend one on Monday, which will take place at 1.30 in the afternoon Geneva time. And that's because our session on Monday is running a little later than normal. And there's another one on Wednesday, which will be at 5 p.m. Geneva time on Wednesday the 11th. So do please join those. And a reminder also about Practitioners Day that is tomorrow. Practitioners Day is a fantastic event where we've got lots and lots of smaller sessions taking place for half an hour each session and they're going throughout the day. So they start, I think at about 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. Geneva time, and they're running all the way through to 6 p.m. Um, if you haven't seen the agenda for Practitioners Day, someone will be dropping one into a chat box near you right now. Um, and there are loads of things on there, so do get involved. Today, we are going to welcome back Giovanna um, and this time she's, she's left Mario behind and she's teamed up with Annika and we're going to be talking about urban and out of camp settlements. So without any further ado, I will hand you over into the capable hands of Giovanna. So Gio, over to you. Thanks a lot, Charlie. And um, I'm just waiting one second for the PowerPoint, but I can start in the meantime. So I'm uh, really glad to open the urban and out of camp session. It has become somehow um, a tradition for the to discuss uh, you know this topic urban and out of camp uh, at the CCM uh, retreat. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, and then uh, Jorn and Jan maybe can can correct me. Uh, this is uh, my eighth time that I open uh, a session on uh, urban and <laughs> out of camps at the annual retreat. 
So uh, I think it's interesting. I mean, not only because, uh, yeah, maybe um, by now I have attended too many retreats, but, uh, but um, uh, more importantly, because it demonstrates how the work on urban and out of, outside of camps is important for CCCM. And then also that over the years, we have uh, developed experience and uh, also capitalize our learning. So the session of today hope to be again another steps in our conversation, probably never ending, uh, about the CCM work in urban and uh, outside of camps, and uh, is organized in three main parts. So in the first part, we will have a, um, a roundtable discussion uh, chaired by there. Uh, the cluster coordinator, and uh, uh, we will uh, um, present uh, uh, the key concepts that uh, are in the Arab base uh, uh, position paper uh, that we have prepared uh, this year. Then we will have a, a second uh, part that uh, uh, where we will hear from uh, um, CCM practitioners working in Somalia, in Yemen, uh, Afghanistan, and Iraq. So we will hear their experience about. Uh, um, implementing aspects of Arabe's uh, approach in, um, yeah, in, in different contexts. And then the last part of the session today will be dedicated to the future of uh, the ABA uh, working group, our internal working group on Arabe's approach. So we would like to hear from you, what do you think we should uh, um, focus our work during the next months? So uh, next slide. Okay, so then, as I mentioned before, so this is my eighth retreat. So let's have just uh, very quickly uh, a little time travel uh, in the past uh, to see how we arrived uh, here today at this session. So in 2011, so that this was a bit the beginning of everything, uh, at the retreat in 2011, uh, CCM practitioners recognized the need to have uh, more guidance, more tools, to have a community of practice around uh, working in an urban context in a non-camp setting, because they were continuously um, uh, asked and engaged in uh, working uh, beyond the, you know, the perimeters, the borders of, uh, the borders of camps. So then in 2013 to yeah we start uh, you know a, a consultation that lasts uh, almost a couple of years um, around the experience and skill set that uh, um, around CCM experience and skill set that would be relevant to work in uh, outside the, uh, of camp setting in urban and out of camp setting. So this uh, consultation, you know, went on, we, we talked about this for a couple of years at the retreat, and then was consolidated in the UDOC task review that was published in, um, in 2015. So then from 2015 onwards, um, there were different uh, um, piloting and testing happening in the field uh, in different contexts and by different uh, um, CCM agency. Um, we also capitalized those, uh, there were, I mean, in, in, uh, in the retreat in 2016 and 17, we, we presented and shared uh, at the retreat, they were also capitalized as a, a case study. Um, then, uh, I mean, over this year, when we start to make uh, practice and talk about our practice and our learning, um, so we realized that we had to give more importance to the concept of the area base. So in the UDOC desk review was uh, already mentioned area base uh, um, as an important context about working in a non-camp setting, but was not uh, so elaborated into details. Um, and then, so, from 2015 onwards, we start to talk more and more about this, a bit following the general trends, uh, I mean, a bit in inter-cluster trends of uh, uh, I mean, recognizing Arab base as a, an important uh, approach to work in an urban setting. But then most importantly, because uh, while consolidating our experience, we also um, understand that Arab base was crucial, but then also at the same time, we realize how the CCM skills and experience are crucial for uh, our base. So then in 2000, this, all of this to say that in 2018 uh, was formed an internal uh, working group, an internal working group of the CCM cluster focusing uh, on our base. Uh, the working group uh, is, uh, is still is chair, I mean, still now uh, from uh, um, IOM and NRC. Um, 
And the first year of the working group, we focused mainly on the paper of uh, on uh, mobile CCM mobile approaches um, that was uh, uh, discussed at the retreat. And then from last year, I don't know, I mean, probably many of you were uh, with us uh, uh, at the retreat last year in Geneva, we uh, start to collect the inputs and ideas for uh, a position paper of the CCM cluster on our base approach. Um, the consultation, you know, started last year, the retreat, but went on, went on for some times. Uh, I think many of you that are here today actually, uh, you know, um, contribute uh, and support this process. And I take the opportunity to, uh, to uh, say thanks to all the people uh, uh, involved. And then, uh, um, yeah, so we arrived to today. Uh, so annual retreat 2020. Um, and as mentioned before, uh, we will have uh, the first part of our session will be uh, um, a roundtable discussion. Can I have the next slide? So, um, so we will have a, a roundtable discussion chair by there. Um, I'm uh, you know, happy to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, Monica Ramos from the Global Wash Cluster, Seki Rano, co-lead of uh, OMS and Community in CRS, and Randa San uh, from OCHA. Uh, I don't know if you guys uh, uh, have the camera on. I don't see you in my part of the screen, but if you can wave at us. And uh, yes, so then uh, I would uh, there, um, hand over to you. Giovanna, thank you for handing over to me and uh, greetings to all the colleagues. Thank you for this rich participation. And uh, I think today has a very, very uh, important topic to discuss. Uh, we have uh, very uh, much uh, well experienced colleagues uh, as uh, members of the panelists uh, to contribute. Um, all of them are friends and the colleagues and very good to see your beautiful faces again after a long time. Um, I will start by uh, further complimenting on the position paper that Giovanna was referring to, which we are happy to share this at the very early stages, more a discussion and the opinions over CCCM clusters role when it comes to the area based and it could be sometimes seen as a drop in the ocean because area based discussion is a very, very wide discussion. Uh, there are different types and terminologies and different sometimes even definitions of the discussion. So our position paper aims to work jointly with the different colleagues who are working and different coordination entities as well to better anchor the role of the CCCM, given the history of which Giovanna was already mentioning, and also given the fact that the CCCM cluster, as we always say that we work with people. So the part of governance, engaging communities, et cetera, has been proven to be a common practice that we would like to share through the area-based uh, approach. Now, as Giovanna introduced the colleagues, I will straight away go to the uh, questions to our panelists. Uh, we will have two plus one question, uh, and the third question will come if we have the time during the discussions. And um, uh, I will call the, part, the panelists by names once I ask the questions. Um, uh, nothing really difficult, nothing beyond uh, their uh, wide and the deep experiences. So uh, I will probably will try to have two minutes as an answer from the panelists' colleagues so that we give the floor for the others to uh, uh, in, the, in the chat room to ask more questions and to interact. I first would like to address the question to uh, Seki uh, to say, how does shelter sector and uh, shelter practitioners adapt to working in urban contexts, particularly in relation to relationship with the local authorities and how to maneuver within the existing system, especially when it comes to the legal frameworks that may impact your work. Uh, over to you first, Saki, to answer this question. Uh, um, and thanks for inviting me. It's great to be part of a new circle. Um, yeah, I'd like to like start by just kind of sharing um, humanitarian shelter, usual sh humanitarian shelter programs. We ch target households. Um, of course, 
with um, focus around the damage or accommodation needs of people. So it's, it's very much kind of based on the damage and the vulnerability um, at an individual household level. So um, it's not just tops <laughs> that we do. Um, we do um, repairs, we do rental assistance, we kind of construct new or temporary shelters, um, the whole, whole package. Um, as well as the hardware, we do the social technical support, which needs to be supported in order to kind of gain success. So um, when we talk about urban areas, um, what we found as a sector is that because of the 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 diversity in the the type of um, accommodation people are living in as well as the status of people as well as the tenure situation um people's um needs are very very diverse right so we started to um i think like from from haiti onwards to tacloban um we, we've gained this kind of experience of saying like we we need to give people options a menu of options to select from something so that would include the whole range of 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 those um of options for them to choose so then like that's that's one way to do that and keeping with the household level and then the next would be to what we call um the settlement approach where we look at the entire area of where people are living where we look at pretty much the similar definitions um that 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 the ccm um cluster um refers to um it's really kind of um the multi-sectorial engagement from our side, we would start, of course, with the space, housing damage, and the settlement and urban planning. But then we recognize that like, we need to understand the economics, livelihoods, politics, governance, um, stakeholder dynamics in order to really kind of navigate the, 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 the system. And of course, then that makes it vital for us not to just work as an entity of, of offering goods and services, but really to to um, combine it and work with the existing systems. So the municipalities or the village leaders, of course. Um, and from the CRS side, this kind of comes quite naturally because we, we always work with the local caritases or the diocese as our local partner who's, who's in the communities. So the multi-sectorial, multi-stakeholder, and of course, the, when we talk about settlement approach or area-based approach, the, the essentialness of selecting an area, defining an area which, with high needs, where that is your um, entry, but that's our entry point anyway as a sector. And then we try to go broadly to, to, um, to um, accommodate the priorities of the community. And then the last one, uh, we've been writing this settlement guideline, um, and there's going to be another session tomorrow about it. And of course, I, we've been writing it together with a lot of your colleagues here, like Giovanna is a key, key author, etc. And what we learned from that process was this kind of area, uh, when you select an area, we have to consider the whole population. And this is something quite new for us. We know that the host community, New York Declaration, et cetera, we need to respect the host community or indirectly affected communities, but is our system really enabling us to go that far to our targeting our, or our, our funding mechanisms? Um, is, is that really enabling us to, yeah, um, mobilize, um, yeah, and, and support the people who are supporting the the, the affected population. So that's kind of where we are in this. And, and as CRS, we're taking it to a different level as well. Like we're turning our paradigm from shelter and settlement, which is, you, is, is kind of in the hardware side of things, but we're taking it to um, a commitment to, um, to gain, to support people to gain access to safer homes and communities, which kind of like encompasses the whole human aspect of things. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop there and any questions. Thank you, Thank you very much for these uh, uh, very, very insightful comments. And I think for me, as you talk, I have been really learning that 
you really nailed one important thing that you already have an advantage and you're looking at the strength that you are embedded to the communities through your counterparts in the field, which is really, really important. And this gives you more legitimacy to basically spread on the area-based approach. And the second is, as you said, I think that the ABA area-based approach is a good exercise for us to challenge our limitations and where we have to know that our limit is the sky. And with this, I will return to my friend, Monica, whom we know each other from the school time with the same question, Monica, to you. So how does Bush sector and the practitioners adapt to working in urban context? Many discussions have been happening, but particularly in addition again to relationship with local authorities, given the type of your specific area of coverage and the existing systems, legal frameworks that impact your work. Over to you, Monica. Thank you. It's so nice to be with everyone today. I'm so glad to, to join you. Um, so yes, from a WASH point of view, I think there's a lot of uh, pieces that we can touch upon in terms of how do we work in an urban context, particularly with the relationships of uh, national, local authorities, as well as the kind of existing systems that have been put into place. Um, so I think really the approach is, is one of reinforcing existing capacities. I mean, we, we obviously know that in many urban settings, we, we already have existing infrastructure that will require um, input and uh, to help bring service delivery up to a um, viable level, particularly in a, in a crisis and emergency situation. But we also do look at the human capacity side. Um, and we also look at the governance or, or the actual legal framework that actually uh, kind of guides us within, you know, what can be done for water or sanitation. So I think that there's a lot of kind of three work streams that we, we usually focus in on. And we do work very closely with either, um, you know, municipalities or if there is a private sector involved with the various service providers, as well as um, local actors. So there's usually a lot of moving pieces involved with making sure that the, the water and sanitation or, or wastewater service delivery is happening. And so we really do try to work across all of those pieces. Um, I think that one of the key areas that we are looking to you know, further expand on and the area we could probably do better is really about planning and preparedness. So one of the things that I think particularly in the humanitarian sector that we do is wash actors were, were quite good about getting in and, and setting up quickly and, and getting water flowing and um, finding ways for people to wash their hands and, and get sanitation services. But I think sometimes we're a bit disconnected from the overall master planning that does go on at kind of the urban municipal um, service delivery. And that links a lot to the governance and the regulations. So I think that you know, some of the things, and rightly so, related to CCM and also to, to shelter. I mean, we, we've faced challenges where, even though from a technical point of view, we can provide the services, it's actually the legal framework that doesn't allow us to do that because there's an area that's unincorporated or it's not part of the administrative um, plan. And so really with the municipality, we get into a bit of a, a legal constraint. And I think all of us have worked in the Middle East have seen that with kind of informal settlement and how do we provide kind of more durable, well planned out uh, solutions. So that's an area. Um, I think another area we, we want to work on is really strengthening the, the capacity. So we really want to have more predictable and effective um, high quality responses. I think that's you know all of our goals, um, no matter which sector we're working in. But I think for us, it's, it's even more critical because uh, the, the required investments are, are so high and the stakes are so high. And so we think that we really are also kind of looking at how we can best influence those in investments and also work with our development actors. I think in the urban setting, working with development actors to really unpack how can we make um, service delivery. So whether it's the actual infrastructure or whether it's the people delivering that infrastructure or whether it's a legal frame that, uh, framework, excuse me, that kind of bounds that, um, that service delivery, how do we make it more resilient? How do we make it more prepared? How do we make it more risk informed? I think, you know, we, we are all moving towards not the if the crisis happens, but the when. And so I think that, you know, as, as we maybe get out of a, a very kind of acute situation of 
service delivery um, in the wash sector. In the urban sector, you know, in the urban setting, it's really important to take that step back and, and kind of do that planning and, and doing that with um, those that are, that are on the ground. And I just think overall to wrap up, we just have such close linkages in urban responses with colleagues here on the phone today, CCCM, shelter, protection, I mean, the list goes on and on. And I think we also just more generally need to be better about coming together and providing um, holistic planned services to the population. So I appreciate Techie's point about we're human driven because we are too. And I think that that's really um, something that I've always seen and been very proud of when I see CCCM actors on the ground because we can really see that it's that at the core, at the heart of um, what all of you do. And so I'm glad to, yeah, contribute to that. And I look forward to these conversations. Thank you, over. Thank you very much, Monica, for, for, for the insightful inputs and for continuing always to contribute to these to these important discussions and also for challenging ourselves by raising the right questions, because despite the fact that WASH has always been working with the with with using the same approach because they have to engage with the communities we don't bring water from abroad but we have to rely on local networks but in the meantime as you rightly said that these approaches are pushing us out of our comfort zone because we are confronted by some other legal challenges and this is this is really an area that we are easy to speak about difficult to uh, implement um with this and before i move to uh uh, Randa with a, another question and a relative area. I would like to ask Giovanna or Annika if we have any specific question to our colleagues, uh, Monica and Seki uh, in the chat room. Uh, yes, uh, there was a question about the uh, um, exit strategy. So there was a question about the uh, capacity building, but uh, you know we can pick it up uh, in the second part of the session. But uh, um, yeah, so maybe for uh, for our speakers, so how do you see um, you know how did, I mean how do you see how you experience the aspect of uh, exiting and transitioning on something else? Important question. Over to you, colleagues. Who wants to uh, start? Seki or Monica? What do, what are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, from the from the um, kind of shelter or kind of housing side of things, like of course, like from the humanitarian point of view or, or programming, like we can do this much, whereas people would need um, the 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 durable home right at the end. Of things. So our contribution always kind of considers that kind of phasing, and what we try to do whenever it's possible is to kind of always align it with the government strategies, um, which kind of like leads one to another. And then the complexity comes in, like when you're working with in informal settlements and the tenure, and if they're going to get moved to a camp or a, a resettlement site, etc., cetera, um, where we're at the moment kind of struggling in Mozambique, I think. Um, where, where there's kind of a series of displacements and, and now it's a it's a relocation site, et cetera. So I think the, the key thing is like we try to to coordinate with the local authorities and their plans whenever possible. Thank you, Seke. I think uh, basically it's very, very true that it has to be clear for us that our end purpose is not to do what we do, but more to think about more durable solutions for the future. Uh, whereby Monica will tell us more about this. Over to you, Monica. So exactly, I think it's actually not the exit, it's the preparedness. So I think it's something that we've been trying to shift about with our sector is that um, our, the relationship between humanitarian development is not that of a linear one. So we actually have all of it usually happening at the same time in different parts of the countries in different ways. And I know Sarah and I've been in the field several times together and we've seen it and you know you see it happening in flux and, and you're trying to grab pieces and understand and I think that this is the interesting part of where we are um, and I'm, I'm happy as a sector that we're starting to in terms of the humanitarian side of the WASH sector to really um, put the importance on working with our development colleagues because actually you know as humanitarians we put the mandate on something that needs a tourniquet particularly for you know the large amount of investments that are usually needed to to get to where we want to um, operate in a good way. 
So, you know, and, and urban is, is it because we, we clearly, it's not about just coming in and drilling one borehole, you know, I mean, we can kind of handle it out in a very kind of rural or semi, semi urban area because it is, it is a little bit easier for us. But when we come in into existing infrastructure and existing um, policies and regulations, we really have to be part of, of the players. And if those that have helped set that up, which usually tend to be our development counterparts, have not done that. Uh, in a way where they've they've made those um, those points you know resilient or have thought about risk informed have thought about preparedness, then we do start to find ourselves in a difficult way because there's very limited things that we can do, um, and then we get to you know six months water trucking which nobody wants. We know that's not cost effective and not efficient, but we we find ourselves in a lot of um, you know legal constraints as well. I mean for me the Middle East it was constantly a legal constraint. I mean connecting the ITSs in Lebanon, it was not a technical issue. It was actually outside of the legal framework. Um, in Iraq as well, there are many um, sites around Baghdad that are unincorporated. You can't, even if you want to put pipes in the ground, legally do it. And so, you know, it gets very, it gets um, quite, uh, the technicalities, we can deal with those. And actually we have some of the best engineers on the ground, you know, those municipal engineers and working with those individuals, they're great. They know what they need to do. They just need some support getting there. So I really think that for me, it starts with the preparedness and, and there is really not kind of like a beginning and the end. It's like, we're kind of in a flux, particularly um, with the urban setting, because we also do things, see things sprouting up so quickly. I mean, I think we've all seen it you know, an area that's like an empty field, you go back a month later and people have set up kind of a shanty area and you know they need basic services. So how do we do that? So yeah, I don't think I have the exact uh, silver bullet for the exit, but I, I do believe in preparedness and resilience and risk informed because I think we time and time again undervalue the 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 when we always if no I, I live now in the when you know not if it's going to happen it's when it's going to happen and so how prepared can we be so thank you over thank you Monica and uh, while we are talking I'm really looking at time wishing that it will stop not it will run because this is really really fabulous discussions where we move from durable station off to the first beginning station where we have to prepare. I normally say you don't die because you don't know how to swim, but because you are in panic and you don't know from your, your right from your left. And that's actually one of the main issues that we as a humanitarians are facing. The preparedness is becoming very much linked to the end point, which is identifying durable solutions. And it has been really very much present in the intercluster a coordination discussions. And therefore, before I move to Rwanda, uh, I would like to check with Giovanna and Danica if there has been any other question on this specific topic. There has been one other question, maybe not so much on this topic, but uh, for Monica actually. Um, and uh, she's referring to a discussion in the chat, uh, which was raised by Juan, that there seems to be very close links between Washington and CCM and um, would like to hear more on how WASH can identify those local networks and work with development actors uh, in the same area that are not mapped as in the humanitarian response. So in a way, how to do it. Yeah, no, indeed, thanks, Juan. And sorry, I don't, I don't want to take over the entire discussion about WASH, but I agree. I think Juan and I, we had a great discussion a couple of weeks ago, and this is why I'm here today, is because I also agree. CCM, um, when I learned about CCM, and I was actually uh, at the time covering the Middle East for ECHO as the regional WASH and shelter, and then eventually I realized I was a WASH shelter and CCM advisor, which was great because I got to learn so much more about um, those, those, these two wonderful sectors. And I agree. I think that actually CCM for us is an entry point. I think we don't do enough with CCCM. You know, we kind of live in our own bubble, setting up committees, um, you know, mobilizing, training, hygiene promotion, uh, promotion, boots on the ground, and we don't really think about how that those structures could also benefit other sectors, and that maybe some of the, the better way and the more efficient way of working would be to have CCCM uh, involved. And I remember when I was first learning about CCCM, I thought, oh, we look alike, you set up committees too. You have people going door to door. Wow, how come we've never linked these, these two things up before? So I think that um, there, there's definitely a way to do it. I think that's why I'm here today. I really would like our two um, 
sectors and overall the clusters working more closely together. So I'm happy for us to, to one, work on something that's really concrete, something we can get out to our countries. Um, just to flag, and I don't know if there's any, maybe put it in the chat box, any of our WASH cluster coordination colleagues on this call, but we did plug this event uh, in our recent newsletter. So I definitely think, you know, let's, let's take this further. Let's, you know, do some joint webinars. Let's come up with some documentation and really pull some case studies because I think it's actually happening. We're just probably not documenting documenting as good as that we could. You know, the best practices are definitely there, I'm sure, from the field colleagues. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Monica. And we hear the call. I think uh, it is really a call for us also as coordinators to take this further and discuss among ourselves and to make sure that we are not working in uh, what we so-called uh, silos. And uh, with this, since we are speaking about bigger coordination, I would like Randa, to address you with this question. What do you think that we need or should be doing in intercluster coordination arena differently in urban context? Or should we do something differently when it comes to the urban context coordination? Randa, over to you. Hi there, hi colleagues, good afternoon, great to be with you. Um, I'm not so sure how long I can keep the video on. I noticed that I'm having some connections, so um, I'll keep it on for as long as possible, but just FYI. Um, well, I mean, it's really interesting to hear, of course, what Seki was saying, also what Monica was saying. Many of the things that you said definitely resound uh, with me. And, you know, when I was thinking about um, our, our discussion today, I really had in the back of my mind um, the experience um, that I had working uh, on the muscle response that uh, really um, seemed to, to frame for me um, the challenges of working in an urban context. And um, I, I don't, I wouldn't know if I would say that, um, you know, if we should look at urban differently from um, from other kind of contexts, but I, I really feel that urban poses maybe a different set of challenges or um, more compounded challenges. I definitely remember the feeling of uh, kind of feeling almost overwhelmed, realizing that you know we have a population of almost a million people, eight hundred to eight hundred thousand to a million people, and what that represents in terms of trying to coordinate a humanitarian response. That's just such a huge responsibility and overwhelming challenge compared to other uh, other kind of contexts that that uh, you might be faced with. Um, um, so I would say that uh, initially, um, uh, looking at an urban context, a lot of the issues that you might have elsewhere are going to be magnified, and um, there everything is going to be accelerated. I, I would really like to first start on something I think um, Seki also alluded to, is in terms of the need of the, the, the context awareness and the analysis. I mean, in an urban context, this really needs to take um, huge priority. We really need to have a very good understanding understanding of the spatial geography, um, of the different social structures that are around, um, who is living there, what are the different communities, what do they represent, um, what is their, the various access to the services that they have or to the different infrastructure that they have, really break it down and understand what's going on in that area. Um, um, it's also more challenging, I think, when we look at some of the, the dynamics uh, dealing with the local authorities. Um, we really need to know who we're dealing with, not only who are our local counterparts, but what do they represent? A lot of the, the um, you know, the, the political affiliations um, uh, and also, you know, within the communities also, you know, what do the civil society groups that, that we represent? Um, this, uh, this was also something that I very much uh, recognized in the Mosul response. Um, actually, uh, obviously you can imagine um, access at the beginning um, was almost, uh, you know, was quite difficult. I wouldn't say impossible, but quite difficult. But the first people to, re to the respond to the different neighborhoods was not the international community. It was local civil society organization, as well as the local, the, the vestiges of any local municipalities that came. But with that also came a 
lot of um, political organizations who were trying to curry favor with newly um, captured uh, or liberated locations. So that whole, you know, understanding of the context um, is super important. And I would say that's something, you know, that's a role that Ocha really needs to play in terms of, of um, getting in there and uh, working with everybody to, to um, be able to support the humanitarian community, to support um, um, the appropriate, um, you know, provision of assistance in accordance to, to, to humanitarian principles. Um, the other thing is obviously, uh, you know, in terms of really understanding, I mean, in the urban context, it was clear, um, like the role of markets was just, you know, that's just really clear. I mean, obviously, there is not uh, a lot of access to uh, uh, land that you can cultivate. Um, the markets was were really important. Which ones are functioning? Um, what is the ability of goods um, uh, to come in? to to this to uh, the urban environment do people have a purchasing power um you know is cash circulating these are some uh, you know questions that uh you know were really uh, essential i think and are of particular importance um in an urban context um i just also want to draw on the the point about a need for partnerships uh, working in an uh, urban context i mean especially with the municipal authorities um um, this is key, um, not only in terms of um, setting up some kind of a coordination platform with the municipal authorities. Uh, I know in many um, uh, urban uh, re response in urban settings, there is a lot of joint, um, you know, cluster um, um, partnership with the different aligned ministry representatives, but also more broadly with uh, a kind of a more ge generalized coordination with uh, municipal authorities is important. And also in terms of building capacity, building understanding, um, you know, again, uh, we would see our role in OCHA also to help facilitate contacts um, and establishing those, those um, coordination platforms. Um, also, uh, you know, at the beginning stages of, um, of the intervention is really explaining the role of humanitarian actors and um, uh, what, what the different um, types of work we do uh, re represents. Um, I think we have a couple of examples that uh, we, we draw on in our experience, but also, as Monica said, you know, I think we do this maybe more than we recognize. We do need to document it and, and look at some good practices. Um, we've been doing this in Bangui. We, we've done it, done it in Haiti, um, in Afghanistan to a certain extent. Um, but having said all of that, I think also working in urban context does, um, you know, raise some um, some challenging considerations for all of us. Um, I mean, I, I know for, for a fact, you know, this may happen in, in other areas, but in many cases, government priorities are not necessarily the same as humanitarian priorities. That can be even more tricky to work around in, a, uh, in an urban context. Um, it could be from a very simple example of, um, you know, where to clear unexploded ordinance. We might have a different area, priority area than the government um, or, or rubble clearing, for example. Um, the other issue that comes up also is the question of um, the urban poor versus maybe a long-standing IDP uh, population. Um, and, um, you know, how do you deal with that? Does the government have a, a different uh, idea or understanding of how they would like to, to, to address that? Um, we're seeing some of those challenges on that, for example, now in Afghanistan. Um, the issue of housing, land and property, I would say in an urban context really comes up um, uh, in a very pronounced manner. Um, and we definitely need the expertise of HLP uh, across the board to, um, you know, inform us and, and uh, support our, our understanding. Um, maybe just two last points uh, to add. Um, and th this is something I think Monica touched on, but I, I'd like to kind of underline it. It's how we work with development actors. Um, in, um, you know, in the urban context, uh, some of those lines between development and humanitarian really are very, very close indeed. And um, we have to be better 
and I say that uh, for all of us, I also say it for us uh, in Ocha, we need to do better at working with our development uh, colleagues from the get-go um, and to better understand uh, what the how they work, what are the projects that they're working on, um, and, uh, you know, also um, provide, uh, you know, provide that link uh, together you know with with the authorities I remember that in Mosul one of the first requests that um, but the deputy governor um, made was please please can you humanitarians and uh, international humanitarians and development can we all just meet together so we can understand who is doing what and by the way what is the difference between um, a humanitarian actor and a, a development actor for us maybe we take it for granted, but for um, some local authorities, they might not know, quite know the, the, uh, the difference. So I see really um, our role in better understanding that environment, making those links, um, and, um, and joining up those that, that area of work a lot more. Um, I think um, maybe I'll stop here, but um, these are a couple of um, points for consideration. Maybe one more thing also, sorry, just given the fact that working in an urban context is so, um, you know, um, you know, quite complex. I think the role of uh, analysis and, you know, an, an analysis cell and making sure that we can um, collectively, I mean, this is definitely on the intercluster side, strengthen our analysis of the context Text and the needs is particularly important. So many thanks. I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Randa. This is again very, very insightful and very useful for us to hear. Uh, as you as you mentioned, it's, it's, it's it requires still the, the area based approach and going beyond our comfort zone, which is a need probably, but still it requires a lot of assessment, a lot of analysis, a lot of understanding. Uh, as you said, the governments don't know the difference. I have been in context after eight years, people working with us, they don't know even what the cluster is because we never took the time to tell them what the cluster is or interagency or guidance notes. We did not tell whether we are there to provide all the solution or whether we are a political actor. And as you rightly said, sometimes when we go beyond this zone, we are not conditionally able to remain within the frame of the humanitarian principles because once you reach out to other actors you have to be ready to be exposed to other types of uh, principles which could exceed the humanitarian principled one. I have many inputs from my side I will take this later on uh, for our bilateral discussions but I would like to see as I see that there are many uh, uh, pop-ups in the chat room so uh, Annika and Giovanna tell us what are the questions there. Uh, yeah, there are, I mean, there are a lot of uh, interesting conversation going on, um, you know, a bit on the link between, uh, you know, the session of today on Arab based approach and the, the session of yesterday on uh, uh, community engagement and the session on the day before on localization. So somehow all these uh, uh, topics, they are really interlinked together, which I think it's a very important to acknowledge. Uh, and then there is one question for our speakers uh, that is a bit more looking um, at CCM experience. So uh, how can CCM experience and, uh, and uh, skills that contribute in developing the implementation of Arab-based response? So we, uh, there, we don't have too much time, but uh, I don't know if the speakers can maybe just tell us quickly what they think. We still have time for a, a, a quick round. So we have, thank you for this, we have nine minutes to go. I would like to start then retroactively to start with the one who ended, Randa, then I will move to Monica and the second to answer this question. Where do you envisage the role of CCCM in all these discussions? Randa? Sorry, there, I'm sorry, the, my connection yeah. cut out. Can you repeat that? What was the question? Sorry. So uh, the question coming from the chat is that how CCCM experience in camps and out of camps can contribute in developing the implementation of area-based approaches and the efforts jointly done by the humanitarian actors? Well, I mean, I think already CCCM is doing a lot of work on this. I mean, we uh, I'm looking forward to, to hearing more in the end, in the later in the session, but I think there are uh, a number of different um, um, approaches currently taken um, 
but that they are happening um, in um, maybe non-camp settings in terms of um, looking at um, whether it's a community center response, whether it's um, um, you know better uh, engaging with um, you know local um, local communities in terms of better understanding needs. Um, so I mean I see I, I don't necessarily see this just as CCCM. I see that all of all of us, all of the different sector, sectors or clusters need to be able to better um, function at, uh, you know, in, in different contexts. Um, so I'm, I, I, don't, I don't know that I have a particular CCCM answer. I think I'll pass to our, my other, the next people. And if I have something interesting to say, I'll jump in. Thank you. Thank you, Randa. I think this was already very, very very clear and very useful that we have to work a lot jointly towards this objective. And moving to Monica, in with regards to CCCM. Yeah, no, and I think it's, it's very true what was just said. I, I don't think there's a, the one answer. I think it's, it's all of our responsibility, but maybe one of the things that CCCM could do would be um, to kind of, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't say this, but be the gate holder of kind of what is the, the log frame for this response, you know, I mean, not looking at it from a siloed point of view, but really what is our operational model of the humanitarian um, community in urban settings? And then from there, what are we all collectively trying to achieve? Like, I don't think we've really ever had that conversation and how will we be able to achieve it? So, you know, it's not that we're trying to achieve WASH per se, we're trying to, you know, achieve shelter or CCM, it's that we're trying to achieve dignity and better living conditions and safe environments and avoid public health outbreaks and risks. So I think that if we could actually build that model together, and I think CCM could play a very good role in kind of coordinating all the moving pieces. And I think we'd have to bring other sectors in like colleagues from you know, protection and, and obviously everything that goes on around um, social safety nets and the on and on, particularly in an urban setting and really kind of be, and maybe it's not to put all the homework on you, but be the convener for that dialogue and that conversation and try to help pull us all out of our, our silos because the beauty of CCCM is it, it is all encompassing. And so you all have to think about every little detail at every time. And there's stuff that we miss because we aren't talking to each other about it. So I could really see CCM being a convener in that type of conversation. And I think with the clusters, I think we should also um, provide that space as well. So it's not so much inter-cluster coordination. I know that goes on, but it's more about where, you know, where, what, is our, what is a quality response look like in an urban setting? Who needs to do what? And, and how do we need to do that? And I feel that CCM actors could help Voila, hashtag. I got a hashtag, yay. <laughs> but you know, could chat kind of like drive that discussion and then get all of us good little uh, minions in line and make sure we're doing things in the right way. So yes, you guys are all the gate, all of you are the gatekeepers. <laughs> Thanks. Over. Thank you, Monica. And uh, honestly, like with, with what Monica and Randa are saying, and I, I will listen, we will all listen to Seki soon as well. But it's clear that whatever topic we discuss as a humanitarian is like a machine and linked to each other. Sometimes we can identify it as overlap, but in many cases we cannot avoid it because we are complementing each other. And thank you, Monica, for reminding us that we have a beauty factor of CCCM. So the question there, eight years for you, Giovanna, is just remember that, yes, this is part of the beauty of CCCM. So maybe Maybe you will continue with that. And uh, Seki, over to you. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, um, I think like from, from my, my kind of experience, like um, it's kind of this like skill set that you have um, and, and the models that you have that um, I had the privilege of um, visiting um, through Giovanna and, and one, um, your CRC models in Mosul. And we visited how you operate, how you link resources, how you 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 connect to the government, um, and that was really beautiful. Like together with the um, so the area based um, assessments, where you have like so much local information that you could really knit together, and that was I really enjoyed kind of like seeing like that joint problem solving through through that. That, that mechanism and at the community level as well as at the at the municipal level right and I thought that was really effective so then like we we we, we have taken that on like kept in our mind saying that's that's beautiful that's really working and 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 
and within our homes and communities, like in Uganda, we're starting up something similar. We're setting up a community resource center, but like quite a quite quite a direct um, way. And that program is about trying to induce um, self reliance. So then the concept is the same, right? Like to kind of knit together so many providers, so many local um, knowledge and actors, and kind of yeah direct it towards um, a goal that we all want to, to, to work towards, which in this case is self-reliance and having a better homes and communities. So like, yeah, I think like that, that kind of like sharing of your skills and, and models, um, I think a lot of people outside of your sector would really appreciate and, and benefit a lot from. Thank you, Seki. Fully agreed. Fully agreed on 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 all these all these points. And I, I just since the three of you mentioned Musul, I would like to highlight one point that you all mentioned as well, which is the ownership. It helps a lot with the ownership. A friend from Musul told me that I was as a civil society through the difficult periods and even during the conflict, I was supporting the communities by myself from our own resources until those bunch of expats came to discuss about my context that I have been through it all without even asking me I was just sitting and listening and I lost completely my ownership of the entire thing including the context and the response and this basically is a very very alarming point to us as a humanitarians to learn from. Um, I think we barely reached our uh, coffee break time uh, so I will uh, uh, allow myself to uh, excuse me from this very interesting discussion, very useful one. And I hope this will lead for further engagement for all of us in the future, uh, individually, bilaterally, or even systematically. And it is really a beginning, not the end. So uh, over to your uh, coffee or cigarette or whatever breaks and uh, some rest from us. And uh, then we will start sharp at three o'clock, correct? again. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Saki. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Randa. Very, very useful. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much, guys. It was a pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Nice to see you. Bye -bye. you after this uh, coffee break, I hope everybody had at least a quick chance to uh, get up, stretch their legs. And uh, also welcome to everybody or anybody who has joined in the second part. I can see there may be a few people who have joined. I hope you have enjoyed the discussion, uh, the roundtable discussion as much as I did. And there have been quite a few uh, topics and questions put into the chat, which we haven't mentioned, uh, managed to address. Um, this is great food for thought for us as the working group. And uh, we will, of course, keep them and we'll work, uh, use them uh, for our well, next year's planning and um, these questions are not lost. We will definitely come back to them and also post answers um, onto our website, uh, the ABA website um, with the report together. So I have now the really great pleasure to um, introduce our speakers our, for this session and they will present uh, their country programs and all of them are working very hard and implementing different aspects of area-based um, programming, uh, coordination and training. And I think this is a really nice follow-on from our roundtable discussion, because this really looks at the practical aspects and you know, what people are doing at the moment um, in, in the field. So our um, first presentation is by uh, Mate Bagosi and Maybe some of you have already met him yesterday because he was also presenting yesterday. So thank you so much, Mate, for being here again. Mate is the NSC Camp Management Specialist in Afghanistan. And um, his presentation will focus on um, the transition towards an area-based response in mixed urban and informal sites in the Western part of Afghanistan. So, Mate, I hope you don't have connection problem. Would you just say quickly hello so that we can check if we can all hear you? Hello, everyone. No, uh, so far, so good for the last... Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Great. And our second presentation is um, in person by James Bell from the Regional Durable Solutions Secretariat for the Ethiopia Unit. Hello, James. 
Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Great that you could be here today. Thank you for joining. James uh, will give an introduction to an area-based planning training that they have developed and also tested uh, in the Somali region of Ethiopia this year. And uh, James will give us um, a PowerPoint about that. So our next presentation, which is our third, is by Shadan Nawik and Ayman Al-Yawadi. And I'm sorry if I pronounce your name not very clearly. They are both from the NRC Iraq team. And uh, they will present to us their experience and learning and also very much their challenges of handling the exit strategy for the UDOC, the community centers uh, in Iraq, which has been running in the last um, three years, I think. And um, if you have read the CCM case study publication from 2018, 19, then there was also a very big article about this program. And it's very interesting to have them here now to talk about the exit strategy. So. Um, hello, Ayman and um, Shadan. Thank you so much for joining. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having us. Fantastic. <laughs> and uh, last presentation, but definitely not least, we have Roxandra Boujour's presentation for Yemen. Uh, Roxandra is the UNHCR CCCM cluster coordinator at the moment there, and she will share with us her experience um, is setting up an area-based response model for Yemen. So hello, Alexander. We have all three you. already. Fantastic. So during this presentation, of course, I would like you to sit back and enjoy, but I would also really encourage you to put your questions into the chat because that's what we will be using for our uh, question and answer time afterwards. Uh, we have about 25 minutes. And um, I hope you have many questions for our speakers, but please do uh, put the name of the person you would like to address the question to, because it makes it much easier for Ash and also Giovanna to kind of filter them when the uh, chat moves really quickly. Um, if we can't answer the question, they are not lost. We will make sure to register them and keep a register and we'll come back to them in our next working group meetings or we will post them to our speakers. So there's no problem on that. So um, Juan, could I ask you to start the first presentation for Mate for Afghanistan, please? Sorry, me or Ash? Uh, uh, I thought it was you. Perhaps Alistair, do you? Yeah, I can bring it up. Thanks. Thank you. It's for Afghanistan. Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, this is Mate, CAM Management Specialist for NRC Afghanistan, uh, and I would like to uh, present you today uh, a case from here in Western Afghanistan, I am in Herat in our office now, uh, that is a transition between uh, formal site management or sort of formal site management towards area-based response based from a UDOC center. Um, and the reason why we are doing this transition is because we have an area here that you can see in which we have uh, several informal settlements, uh, mainly populated. I think we have uh, IDPs from both conflict and the natural disaster in the last one and two years, uh, who live very close to another area, which will be this area, in which we have protracted IDPs from around 10, five, five to 10, 15 years ago, and uh, also uh, close by uh, areas where very vulnerable host community members live. Those groups, in fact, they, they mix very often. They are very difficult to differentiate. And um, when uh, there are uh, news of eventual humanitarian assistance, we witness a massive movement of protracted IDPs and impoverished host communities back to those informal uh, settlements and uh, the construction of hundreds of uh, uh, makeshift shelters in order to, to access humanitarian assistance. 
of people who in fact do not really uh, live on those informal settlements. Uh, meanwhile, a lot of people in these uh, um, recently displaced IDP settlements are slowly transitioning towards du durable or um, attempting to have durable solutions by purchasing land and property or settling down in this area of more protracted displacement. Uh, this has faced us with, chal with challenges of understanding the, the different groups, the vulnerabilities, and unfortunately, most of the humanitarian programming has been uh, status-based. I say unfortunately because um, some humanitarian programming has been addressed only to conflict IDPs or only to those IDPs or only to IDPs that arrived two years ago but not three years ago or not even uh, more recently. So this, this has uh, caused a lot of tensions in the area and we want to address some of those tensions uh, through this area-based uh, response. We want to encourage other actors to, to work in a vulnerability-based criteria. Uh, we want to try to promote durable solution and to understand to understand how this transition happens between a, a, a freshly displaced uh, IDP site towards a protracted IDP site towards an urban, impoverished urban area eventually. And we want to contribute to the understanding of those changes through a, through a, through a more holistic approach. Uh, so these are some of the, the, um, the ideas we have. We do uh, almost all the activities that a site management um, uh, or care management agency should do, but we cannot do site care and maintenance because of uh, we are talking about uh, private-owned uh, lands in this area. So this is a very sensitive uh, issue, but we work closely with our ICLA colleagues for HLP issues and advocacy. And uh, we, we, we hope to, to transition uh, efficiently. Uh, we also have a strong cash component that we are increasing um, uh, as an aid to, 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 to emergency situations and which is being uh, very successful in the last uh, year. And uh, we are looking forward to your comments about this situation, whether you have faced similar situations. We hope you find it interesting and we can discuss further. And uh, I wish you all uh, a successful um, cluster retreat and greetings from here, from Afghanistan, from Herat. Thank you, Mate. Thank you for this presentation. Um, I should maybe also tell you that Mate actually sent us a really nice presentation from the field, but because the sound effects were so difficult to hear with the wind in the background, um, there you could see uh, some of these uh, little houses that were built um, just for people to move back at the moment there was some assistance, but we definitely will post it on the website. So. Thank you, Mate, and I'm sure we will uh, come back later to some of these um, issues you raised in the in the discussion which we're having. But we will move on first and have a, a look at the next uh, presentation, which is by Jason, and it's a PowerPoint, so we don't need a video. So Jason will talk through his um, area-based planning training, which they have developed and uh, which I think is uh, really interesting because the request for training on area-based um, principles and approaches has been mentioned uh, many times in the retreat. So um, over to you, Jason, and thank you. Great, thank you very much, Annika, and thank you for the opportunity to, to share a bit um, on this, this training. So um, as was mentioned, I work with uh, the Regional Durable Solutions Secretariat. We are a secretariat of 14 NGOs. You can see the members at the bottom of the, the slide here um, that work in the East and Horn of Africa uh, with sort of an overall goal of advancing durable solutions, programming and policy for displacement affected communities. So um, I'll, I'll focus specifically on this uh, particular training that we've developed. Um, that uh, we worked on at the beginning of this year and, and piloted in March of, of this year. Um, so just in terms of a, a bit of background in terms of why we, we developed this training, uh, REDS is working in Ethiopia specifically with UNHCR through a partnership uh, that is closely aligned with the Comprehensive Refugee Respo Response Framework uh, that is really seeking to build uh, institutional capacity of actors to, to advance the, the CRF in Ethiopia, um, and with a particular focus on the Somali regional state of Ethiopia. Um, and as part of that work, uh, local authorities in, in Somali region have uh, begun taking on greater role in, in leading and addressing uh, the needs of both refugees and, and host communities within the region, uh, but really required support to, to build their capacity on, on how to do that. 
Um, so that is, is kind of where we developed this training. You can see the, um, the overall objectives of the training uh, in the next slide here, but really it was developed with uh, three primary objectives. One was to um, try to, to dedicate looking at uh, unpacking what, what area-based approaches are, uh, what durable solutions are, and uh, really explaining the added value of, of area-based approaches in planning for durable solutions um, in, in forced displacement contexts. Um, also to apply area-based approach elements and principles uh, and how they can link to durable solutions planning cycles. Um, and then lastly, to explain how to lead and or take part in context-specific, um, inclusive and government-led area-based um, uh, solutions processes that meaningfully involve a wide range of actors uh, within a particular area. So we've developed this training um, that we piloted uh, over the course of uh, two and a half days in Jijiga, which is the capital of the Somali regional state of Ethiopia, um, which also has significant numbers of, of refugees, uh, of internally displaced persons, and of host communities, all within close uh, geographic proximity of, of one another. The training was developed uh, with um, an overall kind of aim of, of having not more than 30 participants in, in any particular training, so that it creates a, a small enough and, and conducive environment for interaction and dialogue. Um, and so we, we targeted that or piloted that in Jijiga in, in March with a range of uh, policymakers, programming practitioners, uh, humanitarian and development actors and other key um, partners within the, the specific context of, of Jijiga. Um, in terms of the methodology, it was developed really with a view towards being participatory, uh, practical and, and context specific. We developed the training tools based on the context in Jijiga, uh, in Somali region in, in Ethiopia, but with really a view towards being able to contextualize it for other areas in the Horn of Africa region that the REDS uh, works in. Um, so, so March uh, of this year was our really a first opportunity for us to, to pilot the tools, um, both to actually provide the training to actors in Jijiga, but also to um, receive their inputs on, on the utility and relevance of the, the training tools. Um, so we, we went through that process in March and it was very useful. Um, we received very positive feedback from actors in Jijiga. Um, they found it useful and relevant. Um, we did receive some specific uh, kind of feedback and inputs on them on, on uh, the tools themselves, which we used to, to kind of uh, tweak the, the training modules. Um, and, and there was a strong recommendation that the training be rolled out at local levels uh, within Somali region where, uh, where local planning cycles actually begin and take place. So that's very much kind of our, our next steps in, in our thinking. We were delayed a bit by, by COVID and uh, as many were um, or have been uh, in terms of moving ahead on sort of the local level training. Um, although we're, we're now planning to, to move ahead with that in the next um, couple of months. We're also currently working on translating the training tools into Somali language uh, so that we can use them at, at local levels in Somali region uh, in Somali rather than, than in English. Um, so maybe I can stop there. I see I'm, I'm going a bit over the time, but I believe that the, the links to, um, to this PowerPoint, but also to the training tools themselves uh, will be shared in the chat box. Um, you can also find them on our website uh, so, so you can see them there. Uh, so I'll stop there for now, but happy to elaborate further or, or answer any questions during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jason, for um, presenting that. And I can see that Ash has actually already um, put the links in the chat uh, where people can look at the more detailed um, structure of the training and all the modules which are on there. So. I can see that there are many questions coming in, so please do keep on putting your thoughts or if it's also just a comment in there. Um, I think this is really helpful to have um, the more food for thought, the better. And uh, we will go to a really different context now from the training. We will go to Shadan and Eamon to Iraq presentation, as I mentioned earlier. They will talk mainly about their challenges and their experience because they are working on it right now of how to hand over the UDO community centers um, in Iraq. And um, so if I could uh, ask Alistair to run the video, please. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Shadan, and I am the CCCM project manager for Kekuk in Iraq. Joining me in this presentation, my colleague Ayman. He is the CCCM coordinator for Nainoa. 
NRC starts its implementation in Iraq in 2010 as a response to Iraqi displacement and in 2014 for the Syrian refugee. Currently, it's uh, working in six governorate, in which three of them, UDOC CM, is operational. The main objectives and aim behind the localization and exit uh, strategy, it is one to be able to hand over the physical community center, the second handover of the program activities, and lastly, developing the capacity of the civil society. During the preparation, planning, and implementation of this strategy, there are many challenges that we encounter, as you can see. Do no harm, protection concern, and etc., which we are going to discuss in the next slide. For Kirkuk, what we are doing well in this process is that I will give one example, which is gender. As one of the leading female NGOs approached us in order to support with establishing committees. Unfortunately, since then, we have had committee leaders trying to bully women out of committees. Thankfully, these women were able to resist this pressure with the support of the local network that we helped to create. Why we are doing this? Because when we exist, we are not leaving behind ideas, uh, activity story. We are also leaving behind ideas. In that, we faced or there are many challenges that we face during the localization. One of them is referral as the, there is a massive protection concern, um, ha, uh, follow up, do no harm, capacity, and other several areas. The second one is pressure. As INGOs can resist governmental pressure, however, local NGOs, they cannot really do so. So they are forced to compromise in order to continue being operational. Moving to the same topic with the, however, in Nenawa uh, and uh, giving the stage to my colleague, Ayman, to comment on that. Thanks, Shedan. Uh, as for Nenawa, what we are doing well, as an example, we have the handover approach. So intentionally choose one of the lowest capacity local NGOs to hand over to. We have two months of working together left and the process is good. There is respectful conduct, COVID safe measures, community representation and online information systems such as COBO. They already run a community center. We don't need to hand over our center, just what we know. Mm -hmm. As why is that important? Because we are seeing changes in the way they work. Those changes will outlive NRC. As part of the challenges that you mentioned, uh, we expect a lot of challenges. I will highlight two of them. First one is the uh, data and confidentiality, such as system, processes, practices, are all, uh, are all largely problematic. The second challenge that we expect is the handover failure, uh, such as use of the center for political purposes, misconduct, corruption, misuse, misuse of data for identifying targets. Actually, we are doing our best, but there are no guarantees of success. Thanks, Shadan. Thank you, Ayman, and thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Shadan and uh, Ayman, for your presentation. Yeah, I think um, this presentation gives us quite a lot to talk about. I know that you had to um, go through the challenges you experienced fairly quickly. Um, but I hope that we can get back to them in, in our question and answers uh, session. So um, let's just move on to Roxandra to um, round up the presentations first. So Roxandra, um, ah, you're not talking yourself. Sorry, we have the video. Um, Alistair, please start the, <laughs> the video. Hello everyone, this is Ruxandra, the CCM National Cluster Coordinator for Yemen on behalf of UNHCR. Yemen is a location where we have over 1,600 informal and spontaneous IDP hosting sites and no formal camps. With regard to the implementation of the area-based approach in Yemen, 
The purpose of this is to promote needs-based minimum standards of services across IDP sites and surrounding areas. Areas are smaller than a coordination hub but larger than a single IDP hosting site. The scope is to improve integrated responses to needs by mobilizing and linking partners within an area, facilitate local integration of IDPs through community-led initiatives, facilitate coordination of services to CCM locations which are not managed by a partner, and facilitate local and more granular levels of coordination. The way that we've done so and plan to do so moving forward is to implement multi service delivery monitoring tools, site and area level referral mechanisms and institutional capacity. Maybe not the whole uh, video, but if you guess, that would be great. Thank Hello you. Hello, everyone. This is Ruxandra, the CCM National Cluster coordinated by a partner <laughs> and facilitate local and more granular levels of coordination. The way that we've done so and plan to do so moving forward is to implement multi-sectorial needs assessments across areas, service delivery monitoring tools, site and area level referral mechanisms and institutional capacity building, community engagement for self-organization, community-led projects, community and feedback mechanisms, site improvements and area infrastructure maintenance are some of the areas that we've looked at with regards to implementing the area-based approach. The identification of areas that fall under the remit of the CCMABA are primarily concentration of IDP hosting sites within a geographical location. However, the community aspect is paramount. Geographical considerations are considered as so far as we can identify that the community is cohesive and uses the same kind of services. Partners' capacity, presence and accessibility have also been factors which have been identified as contributing to the effectiveness of the ABA approach. With regards to the CCM area coordinators' roles and responsibilities, these fall under primarily supporting service delivery. Specifically, conduct comprehensive area service mapping and what we call in Yemen links to the protection service directory. In coordination with OCHA, the CCM subnational coordinators and local authorities facilitate regular area coordination and information sharing meetings, promote best CCM practices amongst partners, identify challenges faced by partners, engage with and support partners in the implementation of CCM activities, ensure the functionality of what we have in Yemen referral and escalation mechanism systems, and maintain 3Ws while supporting the implementation of data collection. Additionally, some of the additional roles may fall under monitoring of implementation of the CCM cluster strategy, training and capacity building of partners, and similar activities. With regards to communication lines with OCHA, this has been identified in Yemen as a key factor. The CCM ABA coordinators report to the CCM subnational coordinators and coordinate with OCHA at all relevant levels. The CCM ABA coordinators may have direct links to on behalf of other. As relevant, the area coordinators may participate in all various kinds of forums, such as the regional coordination teams. The coordinators of the area-based approach are identified by the CCM cluster coordination team amongst the CCM cluster members. These are agencies which support the coordination system. However, the decentralized coordination system in Yemen is only put in place to facilitate the implementation of multi-sectorial activities at an area level. Thank you. I think you got cut off, Roxy. Sorry for that. But uh, thank you for your presentation. As you're here in person, I'm sure you can fill some of the gaps which we may have experienced just now. So, perfect. 
We are in really good time for our questions and answers. And um, I will ask Giovanna, Giovanna, what questions have been coming in in the chat, which we maybe should be starting off with? Yeah, quite a few, Annika, but uh, I think uh, um, Ash is ready to give you one. Sorry, we just split between the two of us. Yeah, that sounds good. Ash, please, please go ahead. Hi, everyone. So this question is actually for Marta. Um, could you provide more information and more details on the challenges of targeting through a vulnerability lens rather than a status-based category? Is this a question for Mate? For or Mate. is it? It's a, okay. Uh, do we go one by one the questions or we wait? Yeah, okay. Yeah, please Thank go you. ahead. Yes, makes it easier. Yes, yeah, so the challenges are... Um, it's partly our responsibility to do advocacy in this sense towards the different partners. So there are challenges because um, uh, there is a tradition uh, here or due to recurrent waves of uh, different uh, movements, uh, displacements, let's say, that uh, they, they obviously they, they target uh, the, the freshly displaced. Yeah, uh, But then the situation stabilizes relatively quickly and the freshly displaced become protracted displaced and the integration of those into urban areas is complicated. So um, we have a, 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 a big group of people who have different status, but very similar vulnerabilities. But uh, the challenge is that the actors, usually they prefer to approach them in based on, on, on status. Uh, this is at least what I have witnessed in the last two years almost here. And I am very happy because today I have received confirmation that the shelter cluster is going to have a vulnerability-based winterization, which is what we have been pushing for during the last one, two months. And this is a success for us, but it remains challenging because other clusters do not necessarily follow. And, um, and, and, uh, and you know, because then they are accused of, of not targeting the displaced and then they end up working with host communities because maybe there is more, more vulnerable host communities than displaced sometimes, um, or you don't know where to find the displaced, you don't know anymore who they, who they are. So, so they, they, and then, uh, of course, the question of sustainability and durable solutions comes up like, OK, we are targeting a, a, a big group of urban poor. Some displaced, some not displaced, some perhaps displaced. Are we doing humanitarian work or development work or both or emergency work? And it, this is difficult. So from the point of view of donors, also donor engagement of, with partners um, in terms of phase out, uh, it is a challenge. OK. Thank you, Marte, uh, for the answer for that question. Um, I hope it's, um, I, it was very clear. It was very clear. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, it was. It was very clear as well. Thank you, um, Jason. We actually got a lot of questions in the chat about your training, but um, I don't know if we can address all of them. There was one question about what were the challenges faced during the pilot training, and how was how was these challenges overcome? Great, thank you. Um, in terms of, well, challenges, I mean, there was there was a logistical challenge because we were doing the training just as the COVID pandemic was kind of hitting all of us. And so, you know, people's minds were in different places as we were all sort of in, in early March sort of grappling with with how we, how we move ahead. Um, but I, I think in terms of other challenges, one thing we heard was that um, the presence of, of refugees and IDPs, many different forms of displacement affected communities in a small, relatively small geographic area with very different structures um, and actors responding to those those groups based on population uh, and on status um, created some challenges around finding linkages between them. Um, but I, I think by having those different actors in the room together um, helped to, to kind of talk through some of that, how it, how it can work in, in practice. And the other thing we found is that um, during the course of the training, the, the closer you get to a local level, um, the, the more clearly those things uh, sort of emerge, those, those entry points. Um, even at the, the regional kind of state level, the subnational level within Ethiopia, you have different government actors responding to refugees versus IDPs. When you go down one level further uh, to a district level, it's the same government office that's that's uh, you know has has refugees, IDPs, host communities living within their their administrative um, jurisdiction. So I think that that's maybe another sort of learning for us and, and part of the reason why we plan to roll out the training at a more local level um, moving forward, sort of where where local planning processes begin. Thank you, Thank Jason. You. That actually links back to another question that was asked if there was any plan to 
give the training in other regions in Ethiopia with, where there is no refugees, but I guess an IDP context, so. Yeah, definitely. We, we developed the training materials because as, as REDS regionally, we work um, in very context specific ways. So in, in Somalia, for instance, we have a country unit uh, in Somalia that, that engages in, in internal displacement contexts um, quite, quite a bit. Um, so we developed the training materials with a focus on both refugees and IDPs um, throughout, even in terms of the, the first session is an introduction, introductory section that really um, provides some context in terms of the different legal frameworks, the different, the, not assuming that, that refugees and, I, and IDPs are, are exactly the same, uh, although we, we still promote um, taking a, a needs-based approach, um, there's still an importance in recognizing the differences, uh, particularly in terms of legal frameworks uh, for refugees and IDPs. So that's very much part of our plans moving forward. In Ethiopia specifically, our, our focus has been through a, a partnership um, working on the CRF. And so as, as a result, our kind of starting point for this was looking at refugee hosting areas, which are actually very quite close to, to areas that are also hosting internally displaced persons as well. So we felt like it was a really interesting sort of um, area when we're, when we're looking at an area and defining an area, um, for us, we find many different forms of, of displacement affected communities within that relatively small area. But we do plan to, to kind of adapt it uh, to popular or to contexts that are, are not refugee specific as well, moving forward. Thank you, Jason. Um, and um, maybe we have some other questions, Giovanna, for maybe Iraq. I've seen uh, several questions coming in for the Iraq team. Yeah, so then we have uh, questions uh, from Amalia for the um, NRC colleagues from Iraq. Uh, Amalia would like to know what action do you take to overcome or mitigate the challenge related, uh, related to Andover failure, Andover risk? Shadan, Ayman. I will ask on that and Ayman will follow the question. I think working in the, in the area and knowing the context very well, it really helps in, in uh, decreasing the mitigation or the challenges of failure. For example, this year, at the end of this year, we are have, uh, having one of the handover in Mosul and next year by June, we are doing the handover uh, committee center in uh, Kirkuk. Uh, so we started our preparation our, and our planning from last year because it's very new for us and um, we didn't have anything like we started from scratch. So with the help of the PMs in all the areas and the PDM, we start creating our own tool that uh, is considered as a checklist with everything that we want to know about these uh, particular NGOs or the local NGOs that we are working uh, on or we are, and th those who have a potential uh, uh, identification of the things that we want. So for that, for example, we have a six month or four month period with, that we need, we meet each one of them. And then we have the assessment tool that we, it is the checklist who will move uh, to the next step with us. Then we have the final stage, which, which is the interview. Through that, we decided which NGO is, had the potential for us to, to be the local partner that we do the handover to. Then after we have the, around six months to build their capacity. So we have this, this the legal NGO, or sorry, this local NGO that we are building their capacity regarding international like proposal, how to develop their proposal planning, also how to develop their, their capacity regarding uh, uh, support like HR, finance, and all these in order to meet the, 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 uh, the, to meet the, the needs for the future plan when they want to uh, have a proposal or also to keep the reputation that of, of us as NRC because it's been two years or three years we built our own reputation in the area and we gained the trust of the community. So at the same time, we want this to continue for further. Thank you. Thank you, Shannon. And um, there is a, in your presentation earlier, the slide was not there for too long, but I had looked at it before and there was one part in it which I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about, uh, which was this, the third part where you said the community centers and the whole program was there to build the civil society of this whole area. And um, I think this is a really interesting aspect. And I was wondering if you can give a few tips or ideas or experience, how do you build this civil society? How does it, how does it grow in a way? So 
one of the main of Yodok or uh, yeah, the CC in the area is to build the capacity of the community there. This is for us after the handover, they will be able to advocate for their needs, either with the government or with the international NGOs. So what we are doing is that there are different in the neighborhoods. We are selecting active members for the neighborhood who, who can raise the voice of the uh, the minority or the those who cannot speak up by themselves. And we have a package of training, like safe referral, we have the package of uh, identification of the solution and problem and also advocacy and outreach mobilization in the area. So what we do from last year, we are building their capacity and step by step we are involving them in our coordination with the local governorate when we advocate for the, for the needs or uh, several activities that's considered as a gap and the Governorate or the uh, local stakeholder can participate in solving that need. We are showing them how coordination is happening and also how to address this. And step by step, we are also involving them in our international meetings. Like we have, we are leading one of the uh, coordination, which is Hawija coordination meeting, which is only made by uh, made by NRC, which where all the NGOs are uh, gathering there. And we are involving each month, like around two main or active staff, male and female. This is through this, they know how this is happening. And when we do, uh, because our plan, as I said, our, our main goal is to leave behind ideas. So through the, these, they are introduced into new concept on how they can address the needs and who to go when there is a need or an issue. Great, thank you. I think this is a topic we could talk about for a very, very long time, but um, I also see that we have a lot of questions for Alexandra in there, especially about coordination. Giovanna, do you have something specific there? Because I can see many coming in on that. Yes, so we have uh, from Lou, um, great practical example of hyper-local coordination with the system, thanks. And there is a question, uh, Roxy. How are the local authorities participating in the granular coordination system in Yemen? Thank you very much for that. It's a very interesting question to ask uh, specifically for Yemen because um, it's a location with, um, with great challenges in terms of implementation uh, with respect to access. And uh, most of those are attributed to, to government um, restrictions given given the context there and uh, and potentially the addition of active um, front lines so um thank you for that question it's it's very interesting to to be able to to address uh, this specifically i think the key here as with any ccm activities is is participation um for us what's been made apparent throughout um, the last year and a half is that um, potentially also due to, to a system, a governance system that is um, highly fragmented in Yemen. What we've learned is that by applying the area-based approach and by reducing the uh, layers of, uh, of coordination that are needed at the very local level, we found out that actually at the local level, which is not really surprising, but it is, it is a very interesting to highlight, at the local level, those constraints uh, disappear. Given the fact that what we've applied is a very uh, thorough model of identifying a community cohesiveness uh, element, we've often found out that uh, the authorities which serve these areas are, um, or are at least related to uh, uh, members of the community, thus their interest to, to highlight and heighten um, the implementation there. So um, many different factors have, uh, have influenced the way that we engage with local authorities. Um, we've tried to have an approach that looks at all levels of involvement. Initially, this was discussed at the central level and agreed upon with central level authorities, but as said, and as we experience as CCM practitioners in many, many uh, contexts, uh, the government is highly, highly fragmented. So, so then the approach was to have um, discussions about explaining uh, this, this um, approach and its uh, strong links to, to durable solutions. Um, at all levels in the same time. So I would, I would highly um, recommend, recommend such an approach when, when looking at a similar model. 
Um, additional to that, we took a very uh, people-oriented, again, very specific to CCM, a very people-oriented um, approach when identifying communities. So community mapping was part of that, in which the authorities were highly, again, at the local level, were highly involved. Um, Apart from that, we had very uh, detailed sessions on, on coordination, on uh, humanitarian responses and so on with the community. And by the community, I mean inhabitants of the sites and host community of which needs were uh, identified as the same. And again, they use the same type of services. So in these discussions, the authorities was, were also, also again present. Um, again, given the context in Yemen, uh, and I'm sure applicable to other, other contexts as well, the authorities there as the community itself belong to different uh, um, groups or are affiliated in different ways. So again, their participation is key. Given the fact that the ABA approach that we took, again, has a very um, strong component or a very strong orientation towards durable solutions again in a very difficult context like Yemen which uh, which we know that um, is the one of the the largest humanitarian crisis at the moment um, I think uh, yes I think just to sum up I think this this uh, this is key just uh, ensuring that every uh, level and and every uh, group, that everyone, including the authorities, may belong to are involved in all, uh, all stages of the process. I hope that uh, responds to the question. Thank you, Roxy. Thank you very much. And um, just to follow up a little bit, um, because I, you haven't mentioned it so much, but there is also this, you know, let's call it, new role of area coordinator, which is kind of being maybe inserted in the coordination level on very local level. Would you maybe um, explain that a little bit, how these two systems work together? Because that was a question earlier, how the area-based coordination and the cluster coordination, how they move together at that level. Thank you again, a really, really good question. Um, they, they are not separate the systems to begin with. The area coordination um, for CCCM is uh, directly connected to the cluster coordination system and the coordinators of an area um, report to, to the regular cluster coordination structures. But I believe that, um, I believe that this is very, a very interesting question apart from the technicalities, because it highlights the fact that in Yemen, the area-based approach used a CCCM implementation as an entry point, starting from a camp-like setting. So we didn't take the approach of the traditional UDOC approach of establishing community centers or community resource centers, but we used the, the site, so to speak, as the determining factor to move forward. So essentially we had classical, somewhat classical because we're talking about spontaneous and informal camp-like settings. Um, so we had the classical implementation of CCCM starting at site level, which then uh, we've determined that um, is needed to expand in terms of a geographical scope where a community is identified as such and where the level of needs are uh, are equal, so um, so yeah, I think that's a, that's another uh, quite interesting aspect of this example, which which I'm sure might be applicable in other locations as well. So thank you for that question. Thank you, Roxy. And um, I was wondering, uh, Giovanna, do we have? Um, I know we, this is another uh, topic we could talk for for a very long time, but um, in a way. We see this uh, discussion here now as a, as a starting point, in a way, as a starting point for our discussion for 2021 in the working group. So I know we will not solve any problems or um, come to any conclusion, but we're hoping this is like the point from where we can see what, what we want to develop next as, as a community of practice here together. But Giovanna, do we have any other questions or, um, because I, I can see them be running out of time. 
We have uh, many other questions, and I was typing yes. myself a comment to Roxy, uh, but uh, I think we need uh, to, yeah, to move to the last piece of our session. Uh, of course, we will, uh, uh, you know, save all the discussion that are currently ongoing in the chat, and uh, you know, we will use to, um, yeah, design and plan, you know, the, the work of uh, the working group uh, during the next month. <clears throat> and actually, I'm going back. Um, so we had uh, a good discussion uh, um, about more in general about uh, Arab-based approach with our guest speakers in the first steps. Now uh, we discuss uh, more on our uh, CCM experience uh, on different aspects of it. And, uh, and now I would go back to the working group because we really uh, would like to know from you what we should focus on during the next month. And we would really like to know also um, which are the modality that you think are more helpful for you, which are the topic that uh, um, yeah, you feel uh, um, would be you know, of support for, you, for your practical work in the field. So um, I, we plan a poll with two questions. So if you can uh, um, take a few minutes and uh, if uh, um, yeah, the poll should, uh, yes. So I, I think you should see it in front of you. And there are two main questions. Take, uh, you know, take your time to think about it. So what do you think are the main aspects of ABA that the CCM Arab-based working group should focus on in 2021? So uh, it's, you know, we somehow uh, identify some um, areas uh, of interest um, uh, based on the conversation of today, but then also, um, you know, other conversation we had previously. Uh, and then we really would like to, um, I mean, you to suggest any other topics that you think are important, also based on the discussion from today. So uh, would you like to focus on area-based programming in urban sites, on local area-based coordination model, you know, thinking a bit uh, uh, from uh, Roxy presentation. Um, uh, would you like to focus more on exit strategy and localization of community resource center, thinking uh, a bit uh, at the presentation of our colleagues in Iraq. Um, we um, had a very good uh, inputs about uh, ABA training models. Uh, and then, yeah, any other ideas that you think would be useful for you if this working group would work on during the next month. Then also, so Annika and I, uh, we often discuss and try to understand which are the best modality actually to be, um, to be uh, a support for you. Uh, so we, we don't know exactly. So is it better to have webinars? Uh, is it better to have, uh, uh, I mean, we do know that in an ideal world would be nice to have, a, you, know, you know, multiple option altogether, but it's also, um, you know, also we want to be realistic and, uh, you know, identify which are the priority that, I, I mean, that actually uh, activities that we can do with the resources that we have. So uh, if you have to choose what you would prefer, you would prefer to have a webinar where we share, you know, lesson learned and experience. You would prefer to have like a collection of tools, uh, strategies, Strategy and documents that have been developed in different uh, contexts that you can, uh, uh, you know, access easily. Um, if you need inspiration, if you want to know what, uh, you know, what type of tool and guidance and documents have been developed in other contexts, uh, would you prefer to have a kind of uh, um, community of party elders where uh, it's easy to make a question, and receive support, and again, any other ideas that you would like to uh, propose to us. So uh, please, uh, uh, I don't see how many people uh, um, are actually um, have votes so far. We just surpassed 50%. So, okay, so maybe let's leave <laughs> a little bit more time because, uh, um, because it would be good to, you know, to really, um, yeah, have your inputs. So I'm just checking the chat in the meantime. Yeah, we have 30 people who haven't responded yet. Only 30 people. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what you prefer. And then again, use the chat. 
we will uh, uh, really read carefully at all the chat and we will try to to use all of this to uh, design um, yeah our uh, our work plan for the next month so i think um, yeah ash if you wanted to do we have some results i don't see anything ah. okay so uh, let's have a look together. Um, I mean, there is a, a bit of everything. Um, so I think the local area-based coordination model is the one that uh, somehow is seems uh, uh, more interesting, even if uh, you know exit strategies is also exit strategy and ABA they are also quite close. Uh, okay, but we have a, um, a preference for collection of tools, strategy, uh, documents uh, um, developed by CCM practitioner, which is a, a good indication. Um, good. So thanks a lot for that. This is extremely useful for us and also useful any other input uh, that uh, you put in the chat. Um, do we have a, do we have another uh, another uh, um, PowerPoint with our contact exactly? So if you would like to uh, be um, let's say more um, engaged in this discussion regarding uh, this approach, if you would like to contribute, if you would like to share your experience, uh, if you would like to present uh, your activities, please do contact us. Uh, um, get in touch uh, via email, and we will. Um, we will get back to you and um, yeah, and uh, engage you more in this discussion. Uh, we normally, when we do have webinar or initiative, this will be posted on the, the CCM website. Will be sent by the mailing list, so the information will uh, you know will reach you somehow. And uh, um, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm uh, um, uh, Anik. I don't know if you have any um, closing remarks. I'm uh, very happy that. Uh, uh, we had the, my eighth <laughs> session on, on the urban outside of camps at the retreat. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Annika, you, you want to say? Well, as a, as a closing remark um, from my side is, of course, I would love to have a really loud applause, uh, like an applause for all our speakers. Um, they have put a really huge amount of effort into uh, the videos and recordings and re-recordings and um, so if we could all really applause them and if any of the speakers has a closing remark they would like to make maybe something that you know like in a reaction to what the whole discussion or seeing the other presenters then please do unmute and and make a closing remark from your side If not, that's also okay. So then, uh, uh, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for uh, for all your presentation. And I would uh, over to you, Charlie. Thank you all very much. Uh, I think a huge thanks to all of the speakers involved, not only for preparing their materials, but also for facing tough questioning in the session. So well done for that and thank you. And also thank you to Annika, Asherine, and Gio and Dare for, for another great session. Before we close today, I just wanted to share a couple of things with you. So uh, firstly, a reminder of Practitioner's Day. So Practitioner's Day is tomorrow. And uh, I just wanted to give you a quick example of the, I know you can't read this, it's too small, but the huge wealth of different sessions that are taking place tomorrow from very early in the morning through till the end of the day. Some of them are 15 minutes long, some of them are 30 minutes long. It's really micro learning stuff. So you've got the opportunity to just jump in and jump out as you want to and, and have a go at any of these sessions. So the agenda will be, a link to the agenda will be dropped into the chat right now. So you can do that. So please, hopefully we'll see you there. Um, and then what I also wanted to do was, as we do at the end of each day, just ask you to just take a couple of minutes to tell us what you liked about today um, and also what would make tomorrow better. And you can do that by grabbing your phone, going to menti.com and using that code at the top of the screen. It's really helpful for us. We look through it every evening so we can try and plan and adjust the next day. So every what, evening, what did you like about today and what would make tomorrow better? That'd be great. And we'll leave this open just for a couple of minutes so you can do that. When you've done that, thanks very much. And we'll hopefully see you at Practitioner's Day tomorrow. Thanks. Bye, guys. Thank you very much. Thank see you. you next year. Thank bye. You. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Thank bye. you.
Bye-bye.